We start with an invited talk by Pascu Moka. He is from uh, the University of Oradea. Uh, at the same time, as we can see, he has also a, a relation to the Technical University of Budapest, working with the, uh, in, in the group of uh, uh, Gergely Zarang. He is going to speak about uh, a very popular uh, subject in uh, quantum physics, about quantum quenches and uh, its uh, spatial uh, form in the S equal one uh, Heisenberg model. So please, uh, Professor Moka. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, one question, can you see the presentation? Yes. Yes. Okay. Slide. Does it work? Yeah. 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 It's perfect. So everything is fine. Okay. So you can hear me. So you can see the presentation. So everything is fine. Okay. So thank you very much for the uh, introduction. I also would like to thank to the organizers for inviting me uh, to have this uh, uh, presentation. So as um, as you nicely said. Uh, this is a very hot topic in um, statistical physics, especially in the study of the uh, non-equilibrium um, uh, of uh, various uh, uh, strongly correlated um, system. Uh, in particular here, I, I will uh, discuss the um, a problem, a quantum quench problem in a S equal one uh, Heisenberg model. So this work was done um, in collaboration with um, other three people from uh, from uh, University of Budapest from Bute. I will uh, so is uh, one is uh, Gergely Zarand uh, and uh, the other one is Kormos uh, uh, Marton Ursh uh, Legeza who's uh, working uh, at the Wigner Institute. He also participated in this uh, work, and uh, the last one is um, Miklos uh, Werner who was uh, kind of a, the uh, PhD student at that time and he did most of the uh, numerical calculations. Okay, so uh, let me just briefly um, present the outline of the uh, presentation. So first I'll uh, discuss the model, which is the S equal one, oops, sorry, the S equal one chain. And I'll show you what type of quench uh, we are uh, looking at. And then I'll present like uh, two approaches that were used to investigate these quenches. So one is the non-abelian uh, TEBD, so this is time evolving block decimation algorithm. So it's like, uh, uh, like um, time dependent DMRG sort of an approach. And uh, the other one is the uh, semi-classical and the hybrid semi-classical uh, approximation, which is suitable to study like a system with a small quench but at relative long times. And then uh, the main problem that we are trying to look at is to study and see what's happening with the spin distribution of the half chain. It is like the problem for the entanglement entropy, if you want to think of it. So you cut your system in half. So you have, let's say uh, you have your system, you cut it in half, and then you look what's happening with the uh, spin distribution and how does it evolve in time um, following the, uh, the quench. And in the end, if I'll have some time, I also present a minimal model. This is like a microscopic model uh, that is able to uh, kind of uh, uh, fit and um, give a little bit of more insight into the uh, propagation of uh, quasi particles. Okay, so let me first uh, present you the model, Hamiltonian, and the type of quench that we um, considered. So, the Hamiltonian is basically the S equal one Heisenberg chain with a J positive. So it's an anti-ferromagnetic uh, chain. And uh, this is known to have a gap ground state. And the uh, ground state in the absence of the magnetic field uh, is a total spin S equal zero. So it's a singlet many body state. Uh, if you think of the quasi particles of this model, uh, these are well described by the O3 nonlinear sigma model. And in that regard, the spectrum of the quasi particle is a relativistic spectrum with a gap. 
So this gap is approximately 0.41. So here it's in units of J, everything is in units of J. And the velocity, I mean the light uh, velocity, so the quasi-particle is like 2.4. This is in J uh, times the band, uh, uh, I mean the lattice distance. Okay, so this is a relative well-studied model. So basically, uh, the ground state and the spectrum and I mean the ground state and the quasi particle spectrum, the gap was uh, thoroughly investigated in this paper by white and Affleck using the BMRG um, approach. So this will be if you want our final Hamiltonian after the quench the quench protocol instead, so we consider the time dependent Hamiltonian. Uh, which consists of two terms. So this is like I said, the final term. And the second one uh, is the bi-quadratic term. So this is bilinear bi-quadratic model after all, in which we switch off J2 at T equals zero over a period, uh, over a switching time TQ that we denoted here. So if this TQ is shrink to zero, then you will have sort of a, a sudden quench on the other hand, if this TQ is finite, you will have a relative smooth uh, quench. And uh, the way we proceed is first we initialize the ground state of the system. Uh, for a given J1 and J2, we perform a DMRG calculation and uh, get the ground state. And then at T equals zero, we turned off. So we switch off uh, J2 and let the system uh, evolve by using the uh, TEBD uh, approach. This is one of the approaches that, uh, one of the method that, uh, that we use. But uh, there, is a, a, there is a problem here because um, trying to reach relative long times, uh, we are forced to use uh, non-abelian uh, symmetries. Uh, the thing is that our main problem uh, that we try to address is to cut the system in half at some later time, and then to look at the distribution of the total spin of half of the chain. So basically in this plot here, what, you, what we want to do is we want to reach relative long time, such as to see uh, the features uh, due to the quasi particles which are creating uh, during this quench. And uh, we measure the uh, distribution of the spin as function of time. So this is the quench uh, protocol. So let me tell you a few words about uh, the method that we use. So, um, because uh, I, yes, they have seen at the presentation, there are many interesting fields. So maybe some of them, uh, some uh, are used with these um, methods, maybe others are not. So I'll, I'll just try to give a, a very uh, simple introduction to it. So the matrix product state construction, what it does, it, uh, represents uh, the wave function as a product of matrices. Uh, these are not really matrices. These are actually tensors because each one has like uh, three uh, indices. But uh, how does it go? So in general, if you start from a relative, from a general state, like a pure state, which is uh, displayed here, where this sigma one up to sigma L, these are the local states. So the wave function is built as a superposition of uh, local uh, states. Here, because we talk about S equal one uh, Heisenberg model, the sigma can be zero, uh, one, zero and uh, minus one. And then we perform what is called a Schmidt decomposition by performing a cut at a position L along the chain. And the chain is supposed to be L long. So there are capital L sites along this chain. And if we do this uh, Schmidt decomposition, then we can write the wave function in this way. And here alpha left and alpha right, these are the so-called Schmidt states for the left and for the right part of the chain. And these are the Schmidt values, these lambdas. Then you perform another cut at a L plus one position. So you shift the cut with one side, let's say towards the right in this case. And you perform exactly the same Schmidt decomposition. And later on, what you can do is to relate the Schmidt states at the cut L plus one with the Schmidt state at the cut L through a matrix and the local state at site L plus one. And then you can think of it iterating uh, this procedure 
and uh, you end up with uh, such a representation for the wave function. And this representation, uh, usually people uh, what uh, are using is like graphical representation. Uh, here you have the chain and these dots, these represent basically the A matrices and alpha, these are the labels for the matrices here and sigma, these are the uh, physical labels of the matrices that describe the local state. So in our case, these all these sigma, sigmas are zero and plus minus uh, one. Okay, so as I said, uh, these A are actually tensors because they have, you can see here, there are like three labels. So if we talk about alpha two or A two, then we have two labels, alpha one, alpha two, and another label, uh, sigma two. So uh, what is, uh, uh, what's happening uh, when uh, you want to include also the symmetries in the problem, uh, then you need to complicate a little bit the things. And um, as I'll, as I'll uh, show in immediately, uh, this will um, have a very uh, useful implication in what it means to uh, computational time and, um, and uh, saving a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, space on the hard drive when you do such uh, um, calculations. So uh, you can do a similar Schmidt decomposition when you have a state which is a singlet uh, ground state. And um, in that case, um, instead of uh, a simple labeling like sigma, what we had before, now we um, label these states by, so or we replace more exactly these states by multiplets. And um, within a given uh, multiplet, uh, this capital S I, so this is the uh, total spin this is tau i, this is labeling the multiplet, and this mu i is like the magnetic quantum number, so it's an internal quantum number that labels the uh, multiplet. So the advantage of using the symmetry is like, instead of working with states, now we work with multiplets, and this uh, helps a lot. Um, but it complicates things at the same time. So if we now do uh, the similar Schmidt uh, decomposition, we can again relate two consecutive uh, states, uh, Schmidt states at site, let's say L and L plus one again, but now because of the, the presence of the multiplets, we have also the Klebsch gordon entering this expression, but uh, this capital A and the Klebsch gordon itself can be viewed also as uh, tensors. And these are called non-abelian uh, tensors. And if we do a like a graphical representation of such objects, now instead of like three labels for A, now we have four labels and the same for the Klebsch gordon And this extra label alpha here, this is the so-called outer multiplicity label. And uh, if we think of uh, symmetric groups like uh, the spin here, SU2 groups, then this is irrelevant because um, in the direct product, uh, when we decompose the direct product of two groups, uh, there is only one appearance of another group. But if we go to uh, more complicated groups like the SU3 group, uh, then uh, this alpha uh, label is uh, important. So we cannot avoid it. So, um, now we can, uh, I, I won't get into too many uh, technical details. I just want to show you this graphical representation of the so-called non-abelian matrix product uh, state. So it contains now two layers. One is again, uh, the A matrices, but it contains another layer that consists only of klebsch gordon uh, coefficients. And uh, the goal of using um, TBD approach with this any MPS state is to do TBD only on the upper layer and somehow integrate out these collapses. And uh, uh, these uh, objects, as I said, this can be viewed as uh, an tensor. And very recently, we posted uh, a new paper here on archive. So it's not yet published, but uh, it's on archive. Um, in which we discuss um, all the features of these uh, NA tensors, how we can um, uh, contract various indices. So basically here, any internal um, uh, or any um, incoming or outgoing uh, line, which are the legs of the tensor are tied to some uh, local uh, or global representations as, as local as prime in this case. And uh, some uh, 
legs can depend only on one representation or on one symmetry, while others like alpha in this case can depend on all uh, three uh, representations. So we can do basically uh, various um, operations like contraction, uh, summing, uh, product of these um, operators. Okay, so um, let me uh, tell you just a few words about the TEBD algorithm. So um, this was introduced by Vidal in 2004. It's a very nice way to evolve the wave function of a system in a case when uh, you have a nearest neighbor uh, Hamiltonian. So if you now think of the wave function as being a matrix product state, what you need to do, you need to, uh, to split your Hamiltonian in two for even and odd sides. So you write it in this way, and then you need to trotterize basically your Hamiltonian. You split uh, the time into some uh, small delta t uh, intervals, and then you propagate uh, the solution. There are a few technical uh, tricks that uh, you need to perform in order to recover again an MPS state. And that implies to do some SBD uh, operations on uh, like uh, two side problem here, you apply the operator and then uh, you obtain uh, like a huge object here for which you do a SBD and then you reconstruct uh, your matrix product state at a um, later time. Below here is just a sketch on how to do the TEBD calculation for non-abelian MPS state. So as I said, you have now two layers and then you have the U operator. So to understand that it's better to compute this um, uh, expectation value U uh, of uh, the U operator, for example. And uh, what you need to do, you need to take advantages of the sum rules uh, for the clefsch gordon Coefficient. So basically, you can integrate all the clefsch gordons for all the chain, because here U is acting only on two nearest neighbor sides again. So you integrate all the other clefsch gordons, and you are left with a relative complicated object here, which is like the um, evolution operator. And this is the reduce U that can now, you can see, it just acts on the upper uh, layer. And this is a huge gain when it comes to computation and now probably is the best time to uh, tell you. So basically if uh, we, we benchmark it on the SU3 uh, Hubbard model and there you have a gain of 10 to the five in uh, speed and also 10 to the five in memory. So it's a huge, huge gain if you do that. And more importantly, you can use or you can reach bone dimension on a simple PC, which are like 10,000 um, in the uh, if we talk about states. And um, basically you can port your, uh, let's say, heavy, or you, you can port a regular MPS uh, calculation, which in principle you can do it only on a supercomputer. You can move it to a simple uh, PC and uh, perform it there. Okay, and uh, now it comes to the real problem that we want to attack with this. And why is that useful? Um, to have all this um, complicated uh, structure. Because if we write our wave function in this way, then basically we organize the state by block, by sectors, with a given total spin in each block. And this is a very, uh, and then we have a very simple way to compute uh, the distribution of the total spin when you perform any cut along the chain. So if we cut now the system in half here, all we need to do is to get the Schmidt values for that particular cut. And then we can compute the um, distribution of the uh, spins. Okay, so this is actually what uh, we did. So uh, before going uh, and presenting uh, the results, let me also tell you a few words about the uh, semi-classical or the hybrid semi-classical approach that we also uh, used. So this is like an extension of uh, a work done by Sachte and Young and Damble uh, some time ago in 97. So they, they, they proposed this method just to investigate the sine gordon model. And um, they have a semi-classical approach in which what uh, 
what uh, what can you uh, or what is it good for let's say so uh, what you can do is you can look at the uh, time evolution of the quasi particle like uh, in a like in we did for example in the O3 uh, sigma model in, in our case and um, you can uh, you can look at various uh, property like entanglement or uh, how you or uh, I don't know I mean uh, the evolution of the magnetization and various correlation function uh, various correlation functions um, in time. So it's a very uh, useful uh, approach, especially that you can reach very long uh, times. So um, one drawback of the method is that you can use it only for gap uh, system because you want to um, quasi particle which are initially in the system, and for that. One condition is that the uh, distance between the quasi particles which, which are created at t equals zero is larger than the Compton um, uh, land scale. Uh, okay, and uh, the method uh, kind of uh, uh, follow the word line propagation of this one, they are reflecting back or transmitted. And uh, what is displayed in this picture is like the entanglement evolution of some fully entanglement, fully entangled initial uh, state. So, for example, here you can see that maybe some entanglement starts to uh, grow in between these um, quasi particles. Um, in the original, uh, in the original uh, approach, uh, such Dave and Yang considered the fully so-called fully reflective uh, limit, in which case. Uh, the collision of two particles is described by the S matrix, and this is fully reflective, meaning S is equal to one. So the two particles collide and then uh, fully reflect. But in that case, basically the entanglement between the initial uh, quasi particle remain um, and uh, no entanglement is spread into the uh, system. What we actually did, we uh, map this problem into a TBD problem. And instead of uh, the fully reflective uh, S matrix, we use the full S matrix, which is known uh, in the field theory for the O3 model in, in our case. So basically we have a bunch of uh, quasi particle initially created at equal zero. We let, them, uh, we let them go, they collide. And when they collide, uh, they collide by uh, this matrix S uh, and um, we look at the evolution of the spin at a full wave function in the spin space by using the TEBD uh, approach. And uh, okay, so let me tell you now what uh, what we what we see. So uh, if we now think about the if we now discuss about the spin distribution uh, in this approach. Uh, we can uh, point to various sources of this distribution. So the first is the vacuum, this, uh, the contribution from the vacuum uh, fluctuations and the possible edge spins, which we know that the uh, S equal one Haldane uh, uh, model has a or the topological end spins, S equal one half at the end. And uh, we can also have a distribution of the spins coming from the quasi particles, which are uh, formed uh, following the quench. So if we want to look only at the distribution coming from the vacuum or for the, from the ground state of the system, what we do is like uh, perform a DMRG calculation for the final Hamiltonian that which is J to equal zero and then cut the system in half and look at the uh, distribution of the spin. And in this table, um, we just, uh, I mean, I, I'm just um, uh, displaying uh, the values uh, for such, um, for, uh, for the probabilities. And um, how can we understand that? So first, if we consider the total uh, chain, uh, we can think of it as, uh, so if we construct the density matrix, then uh, we know that we have the two topological end spins, S equal one half, sitting at the end of the chains. Now we can imagine that we cut the system in half here. And then if we do it uh, slowly enough, then we will create another pair of spins uh, here. But these spins here at the cut are not correlated to the end spins. But if we now uh, separate the two halves, then these two spin will form either a singlet with a probability 0.25 or 
all they will form a doublet with a probability, uh, a triplet with a probability of 0.75. Okay. Instead, if we do a sudden quench or almost sudden quench, we also create some quasi particles which may ha may have some larger spins. And this is what we also observe uh, numerically. But this, if, as you see, uh, the contribution from S equal to sector is less than two uh, percent in in our case. Okay, the other source of the uh, spin distribution is coming from the uh, quasi particles. And um, for that, we can imagine that if our initial state is a fully singlet state, is a singlet state, so these are singlets, all of them, then if we do a cut here at a half, in principle, the initial spin is equal to zero. So this S quasi particle is zero. But then this um, quasi particle starts to move and when a word line is crossing uh, the line here then definitely will uh, change the spin on the left side for example so we'll definitely give a contribution to this um, uh, this um, probability for the spins um, and uh, this can be computed again doing a TBD calculation for the quasi particle uh, themselves in doing that, uh, we need to keep in mind that this is like a Monte Carlo sort of a calculation. So we throw some quasi particle at some um, uh, at some uh, positions, and then we look at the word line. We compute the uh, distribution. We do that um, by um, averaging over the velocity distribution as well as the position. And for that, we need to do like uh, sampling, like ten to four, ten to five, at least uh, such uh, word line. Um, generations. And um, using exactly the same strategy like uh, I told you before, we can look at the uh, distribution of the quasi particle. So having now the distribution for the ground state and the distribution for the quasi particle and assuming that these two are sort of independent, then we can construct the distribution of the total system following the quench. So this is like a probabilistic um, expression that gives us the probability for spin S at time T in terms of the probability of the uh, vacuum or ground state, put it more correctly, ground state and the quasi particle. And this can be understand that you just uh, take the uh, direct product of two this Hilbert space and the total um, dimension is the product to S0 plus one to S quasi particle plus one. And then you assume that in each S sector, there's a random possibility to have a spin S and uh, that just the degenerate of that sector matters. So this is kind of a tell you that this is the total P of S. Okay, so you can do it numerically, but it's better to understand for some limits. And uh, the simplest uh, limit that can be understood is the limit of short time or no collision, where we're taking um, in, or let's say one collision only. So we consider only uh, one collision. So we can in principle compute the probability for one collision, which is uh, like T over two tau, where tau is the so-called collision time and is the ratio between the mean average between the quasi particle in the, and the average of the uh, velocity here. And then in principle, if you start from the quasi particle with a, a total spin zero, when we cut this line or when you cross this line, we change this probability with this, um, with this uh, probability. We, we change, okay, we change it with the probability P over total, okay? Which kind of a tell us that we can construct in principle uh, for very short time, um, the such an expression where this RS, these are simply, let's say the growth rate or the decay of the uh, probability in a given sectors. And this can be computed uh, using the full TBD and can be computed uh, by using the semi-semi classics. Here it's a display of the evolution for, of the evolution of these P's in various sectors like uh, zero, we can see that this slightly decrease. Sector S equal one again slightly decrease, sector S equal two slowly um, grows. But these are for very short time up to like 0.2 times um, the collision time. And it's kind of independent of the quench time that we uh, use. So uh, just to remind you this TQ is the switching time from for J2. So we switch J2 from a given value to zero. So uh, um, over this uh, time interval. 
So these are kind of uh, independent of uh, the switching time and also uh, on the uh, ratio J2 over uh, J1. So basically, uh, we can have a very good, uh, a very good um, agreement between the semi-classing and the full TEBD. In the full TEBD, we don't do any approximation. So we just take the ground state, we perform the quench, and then we just look at the uh, distribution. In the semi-semi-classic, we need to perform all this um, approximation to this way that uh, I just present you. But for very short times, uh, we see a very uh, a perfect agreement, let's say. So there's a linear grow or decay of this uh, probability in time. So uh, in that regard, uh, this is the conclusion that the TEBD data kind of confirmed that we do indeed have this quasi-particle picture form in our uh, system. So if we now look at the time dependent of, uh, yes, of um, P of S, um, we, okay, so in, in this plot here, I, uh, this is the uh, semi-classical evolution of P of S, okay? And uh, there are two extreme limits, which are called reflective and transmissive. And they correspond to the fully reflective and fully transmissive uh, limit. So in the fully reflective limit, basically you, full, you reflect, so your S matrix at the collision like here is S equal minus one. So you change the probability of the spin with zero or one, depending on uh, whether you cross with an odd or an even number of cuts uh, of uh, line, word lines, uh, the cut. So uh, this uh, reflective uh, dash line here can in principle be computed and we did compute it analytically. So um, you, you can get exactly uh, the analytical expression for that. While in the other extreme limit, which is uh, the transmissive limit, you assume that you have high energy quasi particles. They do not interact with each other. So they simply cross. So the full S matrix now is one, but uh, like, for this one, for example, uh, you retain a fully entangled state of this and this uh, quasi particles, so they do not separate in entanglement. Uh, this limit also can be treated exactly, and this dash line here below, uh, this is the uh, analytical uh, expression. Uh, uh, obvious uh, in our case, if you use the if you use, use the full S matrix. Um, um, the uh, reflection is neither uh, fully reflective, neither a partial reflection, partial transmitted. You have transmission in the S equal zero sector, but you have also reflection in the S equal, S Z equal uh, one uh, sector. So here we introduce sort of a, like a parameter E naught, and you can think of this E naught as the inverse of the switching time. So large E naught, or this one, large knot means sudden quench, basically. So that line is almost perfectly transmissive, while very small E naught um, corresponds to very smooth uh, crossover, and that corresponds to the reflective, um, almost reflective case. And how can this be understood? Because in the reflective limit, uh, the quasi-particle must be slow, and uh, in the transmissive limit, uh, limit uh, the quasi-particle are very fast, so they have velocity close to the uh, speed of light. Okay, and uh, on the other hand, if we look at this P of SST as function of time now for various values of J2. I so guess this is the two small uh, conclusion. Yeah? Okay, yes, in five minutes, two minutes, I'm, I'm done. Okay. 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 okay, two minutes or is too much? Two minutes, okay, okay. Two okay, minutes. good. So now if you look at P of SST as function of time, uh, obviously you'll have various curves because you have different um, uh, quench amplitudes, but uh, you would expect that this depends only as uh, a function of uh, T over tau. So if you remove these initial oscillations that we kind of observe for very short times, and then we rescale everything as function of P over tau, basically P of S is just collapsing on a single universal uh, curve. And this is actually happening for all the sectors, S equals zero, one, two, three, four. So we were able to collapse all the curves with just um, no fitting parameter at all. Okay, and uh, 
here is the uh, kind of a, the main result of the of the paper so, or of the work is like um, if we now do this coll uh, uh, collapse so this is the yellow curve basically for e naught equal 4j1 then we uh, sit exactly on top of the uh, tvd uh, calculations so basically uh, what we show is that this semi classical approach or hybrid semi classical approach perfectly fit the um, uh, TBD uh, calculations, which again are uh, parameters free. And uh, we only have just one um, parameters, which is E0. And in this case is like 4J1, which is the bandwidth of the, of the quasi uh, particle. And this is like a display for all the uh, spin uh, sectors. Okay, so uh, I want to talk then about the uh, minimal model that we can construct for the uh, quenches. So these are the uh, main conclusions of this uh, presentation. So we will test that uh, the, this hypersemic classical approach is uh, suitable to model the quasi-particle propagation in um, uh, chains, in spin chains with, um, with a gap in the ground state. And uh, we have a perfect agreement between the uh, non-abelian um, TBD and the uh, semi-classical uh, uh, approach. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if uh, you have any questions, I can um, answer. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, it's time for questions. Uh, perhaps I am going this to- This is the team, so I just showed okay. them. Okay. That. We see here. So you know Hirsch because it's from the Institute, probably? <laughs> yes, um, I, I know all of those, yes. You know them, oh, okay. Oh, yes. I would have a question. Yes. Yes, please. Um, I didn't uh, understand exactly the rationale of the kind of quench you used. I mean, you used the quench from a gap system to a gap system, right? Right. Let me just go. Well, you could thing. also use quenches from, let's say, introducing a magnetic field or from a gap system to a non-gap system by looking at ladders so effectively uh, so why uh, the idea is just to create some quasi particles. particles exactly that's all right and so, the gap systems so are easy the, to handle we kind of wanted to test the semi-classical approach because the semi-classical approach kind of a take care or takes care of the propagation of the quasi particles and that uh, this approach is uh, useful or is um, is meaningful only for uh, gap uh, system. So yeah, but why was there was there uh, uh, somehow doubt that the semi classical system wouldn't work? So what was uh, were people doubting that the semi classical system was not correct? No, it's not, but we just want to test it whether the, so uh, there is no doubt uh, probably. So, uh, but we just want to see if it, uh, uh, so, so um, if we come to this plot here, if you want. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the plot. So basically in the literature before, uh, what was avail available was this reflective and transmissibility limit. So mm -hmm. this is what people is, uh, are using mostly when it comes to the semi-classical approach. And we kind of wanted to emphasize that if you really want to um, get exactly, let's say, uh, the physics, then you need to use a hybrid approach in which you really need to take into account the full S matrix. So the transmissive and the reflective, for example, they do not fit well the distribution of the spin, for example, in this case. So you need to go to a fully hybrid approach in that case. Mm. So that was kind of a... I have another question. If I recall correctly, uh, there is a uh, version of the spin one chain which is exactly solvable, right? There's a dimerized uh, version. There's a version which you can exactly solve. Uh, um, yeah, this is, yes, this is. Right. I mean, you can use better answers to, to get the ground state of this system, but once you quench it and you uh, start to look at the excitations and whatnot, and you want to try to look at the, the probability distribution for the spin, mm -hmm. for example, I think it's hard to uh, do it exactly. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Further questions? So perhaps I ask a short question that. Can you also study the uh, dynamical entropy with your Sure, method? we did that. Okay, I didn't present results, but we did that. So in principle, 
that's also a drawback of the fully reflective and transmittive case because for example if you do that um, if you take just the let's say the reflective limit then you can again compute the entanglement entropy exactly but you'll see a saturation so it's just log of two over two in this case if you start with some singlet states so you don't see the linear growth of the entropy which if you use the hybrid uh, approach then you'll see that uh, the the entropy starts to grow linearly and uh, it's what you would expect with any TBD uh, calculation. And this is again, not captured by the fully reflective case. Okay, thank you very much. I think we should stop here. Thank you. And thank we you. go to the next talk. It is a contributed talk, actually going to be presented by Gonzalo de Fossi. He's from Uruguay. So I think it uh, happens time to time in, uh, uh, the history of MECO that some exotic, uh, quite far countries are also presenting uh, results here. So this is also the case. Uh, I don't know if... Uh, I am here. Okay, excellent. You are welcome. So can you share your screen and, and yes. start to speak about this conformal invariance in non perturbative renormalization? Uh, let me find the screen. Okay. Are you seeing the. Yes, if, we... I, if I go to full screen, you see it? Yes, it is even better. You're okay. Okay, okay, we are looking forward to listening to your talk. Okay, uh, great, thank you. Um, and I'd like to thank the, the organizer for allowing me to speak to you on, on this topic of conformal invariance in the non perturbative randomization group and our rationale for choosing the regulator. Um, the, the line of the talk is as follows. I wanted to talk about randomization group and in particular the non-perturbative randomization group and discuss one of the approximation that is used there that is the derivative expansion which introduces a, a dependence on a non-physical parameter then i will discuss conformal invariance in this context and and see how we can use conformal invariance to fix this on physical parameter then i'll display my conclusions so Let's start with the number two the randomization group. So you probably know that we, we compute quantity from the partition function. And in general, when the um, correlation length is finite, we have no problems in tackling the, product, the system by independent block of linear size chi. And, but when the correlation length diverges, we have problems during the calculation. And this is where the romanization group uh, comes in to as a smart way of uh, rearranging the sum of the partition function. So um, suppose we want to compute the partition function. Let me give you an idea of the romanization group that many of you probably already know. But just to fix ideas, consider that it's a model in a square lattice. And the idea of the romanization group is to consider group of spins or blocks of spins and, and change it by one representative of the group. This is what the, we call the coarse graining of the system. And of course, the lattice spacing of the, of the lat uh, will change. And so we need to rescale the system. Also, when rescaling, we will have to be modify the, the couplings. And in fact, we will generate a whole set of coupling compatible with the symmetries of the system. And, and as we iterate the process, we will generate a, a flow in a, an abstract space of couplings that, okay. So the MPRG is basically the same. We start with the, with the handful free energy, but um, we will add to it a momentum dependent uh, mass term that will regulate the, the um, the theory and move our system out of criticality. So then by slowly varying the scale k, we'll bring it back to the original theory. And that's the whole procedure. It's 
the shape of the regulator is something like this. And as you can see, what it effectively does is to freeze a slow modes. Uh, or this is the long distance fluctuation. So um, instead of working with the Hempel free energy, it's it's good to work, it's practical to work with the Gibbs free energy, which is defined by the Alexander transform. But in this framework, we will work with a generalized Alexander transform and work with the effective action gamma k defined in, the, in this way. So what we do is to reduce little by little the scale of the starting from lambda from a, that will be um, a, a, how do you say an ultraviolet cutoff that could be the lattice space the inverse lattice spaces and reduce it little by little so as to recover the theory of course we cannot put a value of k and just compute everything because then we encounter all the same problems we have to do it slowly and this will generate a flow equation known as the mprg flow equation where g is the propagator defined is implicit in this way and the initial condition is the microscopic theory so this is an exact evolution equation but of course as pretty as it is you still need um, approximation because it's a functional uh, integral differential equation which it is too hard to solve or treat and if you want uh, some, there's a nice review that recently came out from people in the in this community. I leave you there. And um, so we need approximations. The approximation consists basically in restricting the functional space of the effective action to a to a certain a certain form, and then. For example, the derivative expansion that we will be talking about is taking an answer for the gamma k up to s derivatives. This is in Fourier space, is just considering s powers of moment. The answer for the IC model, it takes this form, the partial set, the first two orders, the partial zero and partial two. And if we plug this approximation, this answer into the into the MPRG equation, we will transform our functional equation into a partial differential equation that at least we can treat numerically. So the reality expansion works good and in principle it seems reasonable since we are interested in the long distance physics which should be governed by um, uh, momentum around zero. So doing an expansion neglecting higher momenta seems about right, but it's not trivial. The idea is that when we do computations in the MPRG, we fix a regulator, and then uh, the, the exact flow will follow different paths. But at the end, we will reach the same the same value of gamma. However, as we do approximations, we depart in these trajectories, and we reach um, unequivalent theories. And the expectation is that as we increase the order of the approximations, we will reach a better and a better theory at the end. So this is an expectation, but uh, this is not rigorous. And an argument given in this article I show here by Balog and collaborators showed that uh, I'm not going to discuss into detail because I know this talk is a bit too long, but OK, show that you can make sense of, um, of a small parameter in this context, which is related to the presence of the regulator acting like a mass. So since acts like a mass, you know that it can be expanded around the. Um, sorry, you know that you can do an expansion around some momenta, which has a radius of conversions of in the p square complex plane of of nine times the mass square if you are in the symmetric phase, and four times if you are in the in the broken phase. And then, since the regulator acts as, as a mass of so order k you more or less expect the same behavior and so you 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 kind of expect a convergence radio of the same order of course this is hand waving and it is not rigorous but in any case it's expected so in this article and in the in in the Balog article and uh, and a posterior um, and a work with the we did later we gave evidence for the IC model and the ON model that this is in fact the case, or at least this is expected to be. And so 
there is an, a still an issue that you need to choose properly the regulator in order to have these conversions properties because if not you obtain uh, that. So this takes us to discuss the principle of minimal sensitivity. Consider you choose a, regula a specific regulator, this exponential regulator I show here, which depends on a, a scale uh, on a parameter alpha. And we do approximations, okay? We will introduce a dependence in this alpha of the results and of course the regulator family we are using. And let me show you this picture for the AC model that is taken from the article I just mentioned that shows the X critical exponent nu and eta at order two, four, and six for this exponential regulator. And also it shows the conformal bootstrap result that you probably know that it are very precise for the IC model. So the error bars are, are not, uh, will be overlapped with the dotted uh, fuchsia line. And, and yes, so the spirit of the, of, the, of the principle of minimal sensitivity, PMS, is okay, we want regulator independent quantities, let's pick them when less dependence on the regulator is shown. So it is to choose, the, choose the, those values of alpha that uh, exceed maximum minima. And as you can see, it's the best that you can do or almost the best you can do in, in all the cases. Now, here are some results that, so you can see that the, um, the method is really precise and give uh, res uh, very accurate results for some values of ON, of the ON model that it is taken from this article here. And, um, and I should update this value to this other since a recent work of Martin Hasenbuch, which uh, a Monte Carlo simulation, really precise and really nice for the N equal three. And um, yes, you, you can see that it is uh, precise and accuracy comparable with most precise method. And in fact, if you go for n equal four and n equal five, I think it's the most precise method so far. So it is promising at least. Then conformal invariance. Okay, you know that um, the power law behavior we observe around the critical temperature is a footprint of scale invariance. And as you can see here for the scale invariance, I'm zooming in and zooming out the, the icing model on a, on a square lattice um, at the critical temperature. And as you, you perceive or you have this sensation that you are looking at the same image, if you zoom in or zoom out, the structures are, are similar. So this is a scale invariance, basically. Conformal invariance, on the other hand, includes its transformation that preserves angles and includes rotation, translations, and dilatations. And but it is not uh, restricted to that. To that, it's a larger symmetry group. So more symmetry implies more constraint, and we will try to make use of that. So to give you an example, consider this transformation of the plane onto itself, and let's apply it to the icing model here. Okay, this, as you can see, the left image is the original, the right, the right image is the transformer, and um, this is a, a temperature above the critical temperature. So let me run this simulation. I will, it's not as a, a true simulation, it's just a, a, a video made by me, but I'm going to tune in the, tune the temperature to the critical temperature. And as you can see, you will see that as we get closer to the critical temperature, this, the, the image in the left and the image in the right will look kind of similar. We have the sensation that we are looking at maybe uh, the same image or transform it, but someone took a bite of the right image because the boundary of the, of the square lattice will, be, will, will change. But so this is what we mean by conformal, uh, conformal invariance. So this is just, uh, okay, I sure hurry up. So, I didn't say, but the scale invariance is basically the MPR chief fixed point equation and it's enough to compute all critical properties, but it's different than conformal invariance, which gives, should give extra constraint. So this is extra constraint to what the conformal bootstrap take advantage to the gives really precise I, uh, result for the IC model that I commented before. But we want to address another issue, which is it relies on a reasonable ad hoc criterion. Okay, the, the PMS, it's a reasonable, but it's ad hoc. So 
how can we use this constraint to say something about that? So, uh, conform transformation are, are coordinate transformation that in the word identities in this context take the following forms for the translation, rotation, dilatation. I'm not going to discuss their version of this for the vertices, have the following form. I'm not going to discuss either who this H is. If you want, we can talk about that later. But we can combine these two equations of dilatation and special conformal transformation and to obtain an equation which has at order PQ, this is for the IC model, one constraint and we, with information that is not present in dilatation and at order P5 for constraints of form. So oh, what do what do I mean by constraint if we have um sorry? You should go slowly your conclusion, please. Okay, I will go really fast to that. Uh, so these constraints will take the form if we put an answer, we'll take the we will be violated when evaluated. We will put, for example, the area of the expansion at order four answer. It will give you an equation which is okay. The left hand side of this equation is not equal to the right hand side, and uh, we the procedure is the following: we put the answer by a scale invariance, we fix all these functions of the answer. Then, with conformal invariance, we obtain this equation, which will be just take the left hand side, the right, subtract the right hand side, and divide by a characteristic value of one of the sides to know how far we are violating the conformal the conformal invariance. And so ask the following question, which value of alpha makes the um, makes the, um, the situation less violated? Okay. So we did this for many regulators using in this context that shield very accurate results. And as you can see, I'm going to go fast. It is better satisfied around the value of the PMS. We are looking for lighter zones. This is important. Okay. Uh, this the, I'm showing you the A function as a function of rho and alpha. So you can see that it's better satisfied around this value. And so we did it just to give a better expression. We put one, one, one measure, delta one and delta two of this conformal constraint. And you can see that it's satisfied better around the PMS of eta. And so we are giving a more, a more rigorous support to use in the PMS. And also it's an alternate criterion to fix the, this parameter in the regulator. So I'll leave you my, with my conclusions because I'm running late. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, the talk is open for discussion. Who wants to ask? Okay, perhaps I start. Uh, here you spoke about uh, the back critical behavior. Is it possible to use this? Sorry, I, can, can you repeat, sorry? I, I mean that uh, uh, your approach was here for the back uh, critical behavior. My question is if you can use this method also to calculate the surface uh, criticality for these uh, systems, for example. To compute, I'm sorry, to compute what? The surface uh, uh, critical, the, surface exponents like this, is it possible with this method? To, to, to compute the critical surface? Yeah, yes, yes the, the, the critical exponents at the surface, let's say. So you have an ordinary transition in the Ising model, let's say, in three dimensions. Yeah, you can, yes, you can use it. You, you, can, you can check the... I, I have to be honest, I, I didn't go into the detail in the of the um, in the review I mentioned that it just came out in June or something like that. But there you can see all the application that, that can be done. But yes, you can use this method for for computing uh, phase diagrams and whatever you well, mm -hmm. not whatever, but many things you 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 may be interested in, and in many contexts. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, further uh, questions? Maxim Dutka. Yes. Uh, 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 your work uh, shows that there is no, uh, uh, there is no 
uh, it does not depend on the choice of the uh, uh, regulator function. Only uh, the uh, some parameters should be introduced to make PMS to obtain the physical result. Yes. Uh, yes, you. I mean, there are bad regulators. You can choose really bad regulators to obtain oh, really it's, horrible yeah, results. Yeah, it's it's my it's really, really my question. It's, it's there are some uh, regulators that uh, you should not uh, uh, use. Yeah, you should not use. You, you should not use. For example, there are problems with uh, using really sharp regulators. Okay, you you you. You kind of want that this the the shape of the regulator is kind of a smooth, but also it goes rapidly to zero at, at large queues, larger than any power. And because if not, when you you will uh, okay, you will introduce uh, some numerical. Um, how do you say by by? I mean you're you're putting an. And answer into the propagator, which is a power law in the in the, sorry um, a polynomial in the in the numerator in the in the momentum, and you could you will in, introduce, for example, a poles that are not really there in the when you do the the momentum integration. That you should make those to be really far away. For example, if you I mean, if you use bad regulators, that there are a lot of them in the, in fact, when the people started working with this, you said bad regulators thinking that they were good. For example, they were infinite or kind of infinite for below some scale and then zero or stuff like that. And this doesn't give really good results. There are examples, I think, if you go through the papers uh, I mentioned here, Okay, I, I, I think uh, at that okay. moment we should stop anyway. So, okay, so I, I answer you, you in chat privately. Okay, okay, okay. okay so. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, we should go to our next uh, talk, which is uh, from uh, Martin Weigel. Martin, okay, hello. Hi, hello. We've been know Martin for a long time. I think he was first from Leipzig to the MECO, then from Mainz. Now he's in Coventry. And he's an expert in uh, uh, random uh, systems and numerical, all type of numerical methods. And now he is going one of his favorite uh, subjects about scaling of the random theodizing model, now in two dimensions. Please. Thank you. Um, I should probably try to. Oops, I have a problem that my that my presentation just closed. So I'm sorry. I have to reopen it. Yes. Um, there we are. To share that, can you see this? Yes. Okay. <laughs> you can make perhaps full screen. Is it full screen now? Yes, we can see it. But it's not full screen. Okay, that's not so good. It's not full screen, but uh, it's just readable. Let's try it like this. Is that better? Yes, it, it, it's, it's perfect now. Yes, please go on. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you very much, Ferenc, for the uh, introduction. And good morning, everybody. Uh, greetings from England um, to everywhere else. Essentially, I want to uh, tell you a little bit about some recent results we have on a long standing problem in classical critical phenomena. So, this is work together with uh, Nikos Futas, who's also at this conference and will present something tomorrow and a common uh, graduate student of ours, uh, Iro Mainu from, uh, from Common University. So a random fieldizing model, that's uh, a problem I think which most of you will be very familiar with. Uh, uh, you know, you have the Ising uh, uh, spins and then you add a field that takes locally uh, different values which are frozen in time. And so uh, some standard distributions 
uh, the Gaussian distribution, which actually we will be using in, uh, in, in this work. And also you could think of a bimodal distribution, for example, there are many, many possibilities. Now, uh, you know, the, uh, the easiest question you can ask about this problem is, uh, if you introduce this order to the Ising model, is the ferromagnetic phase of the Ising model stable against a specific type of disorder? And that's this famous argument uh, made by Imri and Ma. You think of uh, a, a bubble of uh, spins or a cluster of spins uh, in a sea uh, of the ordered phase, and then you're wondering what's the excitation energy uh, of such uh, a cluster, well, there will be some surface energy um, and that will be proportional, obviously, to the surface area. So it's J times R to the D minus one, but then there will also be some uh, uh, gain in random field energy that you can expect. Uh, and when, you know, random fields are randomly oriented uh, from some kind of random argument, you would imagine that this is uh, proportional to R to the square root of uh, uh, the power of D. And so if you balance that, uh, you, uh, you arrive at this relation and that tells you that, you know, ferromagnetic order should be stable against random field disorder in three dimensions and higher. It should be unstable in one dimension and two dimensions is a marginal case. So that's what I uh, will be focusing on. Marginal cases are often particularly interesting. In fact, it was later on proven uh, by Eisenman and Weir that uh, uh, this case is, uh, um, you know, in, in the situation where there should not be uh, any ferromagnetic order at finite temperatures. Uh, and so what happens instead, uh, this was considered by uh, Binder in the 80s. So he considered the situation that you have uh, an interface in such a random field system in two dimensions. And he tried to work out uh, the, uh, the energy contained in such an interface and using some basic phenomenological arguments, he. Uh, uh, he argued that, well, there should be ferromagnetic domains up to a certain length scale, uh, which was dubbed the uh, breakup length, and that length scale uh, should uh, essentially scale exponentially in, in H, uh, where H is uh, the, uh, the distribution width of the random fields. In the RG picture, uh, the whole situation is now like this. There is a ferromagnetic fixed point uh, um, uh, of course, uh, down here, and then uh, you have a new fixed point, which is a random field fixed point, a random fixed point, which sits at zero temperature, and obviously also have some percolation fixed point in the system. So you can, for example, uh, write down the RG flow equation, and it would have a linear term and, uh, and a cubic term. Now, how does that... Uh, situation with breakup lengths look like in practice. So if you look at uh, um, uh, configuration snapshots of certain system sizes at zero temperature that is here now, then you see that for a certain random field strength, you have ferromagnetic domains of a certain size. So this is the total system size is 500. So maybe these are about 100 or 200 in size. And so if you had a system size at a length scale less than that, you would see a ferromagnetically ordered state and only if you go to length scales beyond that do you realize that actually uh, there is uh, no order. And so as you increase uh, the, the variance of the random fields, uh, this length scale decreases steadily until at some point you don't see any uh, significant size of domains. Now, so the question is what's the, uh, the scaling uh, of uh, of this breakup length? So in, in practice, uh, what people have been looking at mostly goes back to some work by Alava and Seppala from the late 90s, where you define the breakup length at the system size at which 50% of all disorder samples are ferromagnetically ordered. So this is essentially the probability of being ferromagnetically ordered for a certain value of delta. So delta, I'm sorry, that's an app use of notation. It's the same as what I called H before. So it's the width of the uh, random field distribution. And then you can define a length scale and ask well, how does that length scale uh, change with uh, the disorder strength. And so interestingly, you see this is plotted against one over delta. So that would imply on a log scale, that would imply that the scaling is exponential of one over h or one over delta. Whereas, uh, you know, Binder's argument that I showed here would have implied that there's a scaling one over h squared. So there is some 
uh, lack of clarity about what exactly the scaling is. So in that work, Seppel, I found one over H squared. In some other work, uh, people found one over H or one over delta. And so that's uh, the question I, we wanted to address. And so the way we did that was to look at ground states. Uh, many of you know that you can map the random field Ising ground state problem onto a so-called maximum flow problem, which can be solved exactly in polynomial time. Uh, I don't go into details here, but so we use this type of ground state algorithm for uh, studying uh, um, the behavior of this breakup length or length scale more generally in the two-dimensional random field Ising model. Um, so it's, it's worthwhile to note that uh, the RG prediction uh, is actually not for this slightly artificial quantity uh, dubbed the breakup length, but in fact, it's for the correlation length, which is a much more natural type of length scale. And so uh, we directly looked at the correlation length. It's slightly difficult to extract correlation lengths from the zero temperature calculations because you cannot make use of the usual fluctuation dissipation relation because uh, you, know, you have a unique ground state for continuous field distributions. And so there is no fluctuation that you could relate to. Uh, but in fact, there is a way of getting around that, uh, which originally goes back to Schwartz and Sofa, which noted that you can essentially partially integrate over the uh, uh, random field distribution and get some uh, alternative fluctuation dissipation type of relation that allows you to extract the susceptibility and also the wave factor dependent susceptibility um, to extract the correlation lengths. And well, there are two different correlation lengths in this system. Uh, the connected and disconnected correlation lengths would normally uh, behave the same, but here in this system, there are two different critical exponents potentially, at least in three and higher dimensions uh, uh, that govern the connected and disconnected uh, correlation function. So what we did was to look at a range of system sizes up to about 2000 squared for a large number of disorder samples, a million uh, studying the breakup length according to uh, Alava and, and, and co-workers, but also these two correlation lengths in the system. And so what we find is shown here. So this is the, uh, the log of this correlation length as a function of the random field strength. And you see, uh, for le uh, let's say uh, the, uh, the purple line is for the largest system size. Uh, and if you look at the smaller system sizes, they, they coincide for large random field strength, uh, but then they start peeling off uh, for the smaller uh, uh, variances of the random field, which is a finite size effect. So in, in essence, the envelope of all these curves should be what you should expect for the infinite size system. And uh, so the uh, peeling off here is, uh, is a finite size effect. So now the question is, of course, what's the scaling uh, I, I'm showing here? Uh, is that conforming uh, with one or the other form? Just for reference, I also show the, the original definition of the breakup length that I mentioned before. And you see that this is quite far away from uh, the scaling of the correlation length. And even it's not just parallel uh, to, to the correlation length. I mean, it has a, a quite a different shape and that can be understood from the fact that it's very strongly affected by finite size corrections, which is not the case for the correlation length as long as you look in, an, in a regime where you're not yet limited by, uh, by the finite size of the system. So how can we now decide between these different scaling forms? I mean, of course, we can perform fits of different types. So this would be a fit. So this is now in the log of the correlation length. So this would be a fit uh, 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 for, for a functional form of this type. You see, well, it seems to work reasonably well. But then if you look a fit at a fit which has a linear behavior here, 1 over h, it looks almost the same, so it's very difficult to really tell them apart. You could also have a situation which has both terms in it, or in fact, a variable exponent could also be an option. And it's very difficult at this uh, scale and type of analysis to really distinguish these. Um, so instead, what we did was to really look at uh, the quality of these fits. So you can look at what is the exponent if you look at uh, a form that has a variable exponent, what's the value of this exponent? Uh, as a function of the upper, uh, of the lower and upper cutoff uh, in the field, because it will be crucial, obviously, to determine the regime in which you should perform this fit. If you go too far to the left, you, you will be affected by the finite size corrections, namely that you get into the regime where the correlation length is, uh, you know, comparable to the system size, whereas if you go uh, on the too far uh, to large random field strength, then you will have a problem that 
uh, you're not in the regime where this asymptotic scaling is supposed to, to work. And so, uh, well, we find that there is an area where if you look at the quality of fit, uh, you get reasonable fit qualities. And in this area, which corresponds to the area I've shown in the previous plot, we find that the exponent is probably closer to two than it is to one. So let's look uh, more closely at that. Um, uh, well, I will, I will give you an overview in, uh, in a second. So we, we get strong evidence for, for this uh, one over h squared scaling for the square lattice. Uh, we then moved on to also uh, looking at uh, the triangular lattice. Why is that? Well, there was a very recent work by uh, Jim Setna and co-workers, uh, which actually focused on the non-equilibrium uh, properties of the 2D random field dicing model. But they argued based on RG uh, uh, considerations that because there is no symmetry, inversion symmetry uh, in that uh, RG coupling on non bipartite lattices, uh, the RG equation, according to their argument, should have an additional term. Remember, the, ter the RG equation I showed before only had the linear term and the cubic term, but they argue there should be a square term, a quadratic term as well. And that would imply that in that case, there should be that linear. I mean, linear in the exponential uh, dependence uh, on one over h for the triangular lattice. So because of these uh, suggestions, we looked at our data or we performed additional simulations for the triangular lattice. Uh, and so what I show here is now an overview of the effective exponent in, in the exponential here as a function uh, of the cutoff for the two types of correlation length and for the two types of lattices, so square lattice, triangular lattice, and we see everywhere there is uh, you know, very good uh, um, agreement with the minus two, so the, uh, the square behavior in the exponent, but there is no consistency uh, with this uh, inversely linear behavior. So it seems to be quite uh, a clear cut uh, answer in that respect. What we also looked at um, is this, the self averaging property of the correlation length because we noticed and maybe you saw that as well here, that there are strong fluctuations. So this is the largest lattice size here. Strong fluctuations I of the correlation lengths. Also, we're using... We go to the conclusion. I, I, yeah, I think, I think I should have a minute or something according to my time. I hope that's right. Um, uh, so uh, there are strong fluctuations in the correlation lengths. Also, you know, we have a million samples, which is quite a good statistics. And so we looked at the, at the question of how do the... Uh, the fluctuations increase with L or, you know, depend on L. And indeed, it's the fact that uh, the, the variance in the estimate of the correlation length, uh, it increases with, you know, linearly with a volume with L squared. So there's an extremely strong non-self averaging of the correlation length uh, in this system. Um, but so that requires a little bit more uh, investigation. But it is in line with uh, a previous observation by Parisi and Surlas uh, from a while ago. Okay, so, so to summarize, um, for the first time, we really looked explicitly at the correlation length in the 2D random field Ising model using round state methods. We find clear evidence for this exponential of one array squared scaling predicted by Binder uh, a long time ago. And there's this observation of a strong non self averaging in the correlation length. Uh, for this problem. And so we have a number of ideas of how to extend this. Uh, so we uh, certainly want to show more clearly the consistency also with the breakup length, uh, given that there are finite size corrections. Uh, for the non self averaging, we want to also look at the uh, full spectrum of moments uh, of the correlation length and uh, finally look at uh, some of the conventional uh, um, you know, uh, properties that uh, one would consider in terms of critical scale. So that brings me to the end, uh, I think, pretty much on time. And so I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. And I'm open for questions. And uh, we have time for one or two short questions, please. OK. Perhaps I will ask that you, you mentioned that the finite size corrections are somehow different for the correlation lengths and for the breaking up lengths. Can you have some explanation for it? Why it's more sensitive in the uh, breaking up lengths? Well, the, the, the point is that the breakup length, the way it's defined, I mean, if 
one, one half of all samples are fully ferromagnetic. It means that the size of the domains is very comparable to the size of the system. And that means that you are very far into the, into the limit where you're limited by or affected by finite size effect. It's not the case that your domain size is much smaller than the system size. In fact, your domain size is equal approximately to the system size. And that's why you have uh, extremely strong subleading finite size corrections in the breakup length, which you don't have in the correlation length. And do you have periodic boundary condition in your? Uh... Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the, the boundary condition can uh, influence a bit this. Uh... It could, pro yeah. Presumably, if you if you were to look at uh, at free boundaries, for example, or at fixed boundaries, you would see uh, changes in the scaling corrections in particular. But we don't expect that this would uh, do anything in terms of changing the leading behavior of uh, of the scaling of the correlation length. That's not our expectation. Okay. Thank you, Martin, once more. Thank you. And. Uh, we have to move to our uh, last uh, uh, invited talk. This is uh, given by Ha Wong Yeung. He is from the Korea Advanced uh, Institute of Science and Technology from uh, Daejeon, I think. He, this is a place where there was also a world uh, uh, exhibition a few years ago. And there is a very nice advanced study institute. And he is going to speak now about a completely different subject, about paintings, arts, and large-scale quantitative analysis. Please. OK. Thank you for the introduction. Can you hear me? Yes. OK. And yes, you yes, see that? It seems to be OK, sure. yes. Yeah, I prefer, I don't like the notebook camera, so I set up the camera so you can see the screen and or other things. So I think this might be the best way to look again. So you can see me and also see the screen as well. Okay, thanks for the invitation. And I'm really sorry not to be there. Actually, I really wanted to be there so, uh, because a few years ago, I went, went there and I really enjoyed the, the, the view and other stuff in Romania. But because of COVID-19, I cannot be there. So I'm in Korea right now. So probably good morning, everyone, for your time. And for me, it's almost 5 p.m., so it's almost good evening time. So there is the time difference. Also, as Chairman introduced, I will talk about a little bit different subject over here. I'll talk about the painting arts in here. So we are talking about the large scale quantitative analysis of so painting art. I don't know why the organizer put me in this slot, but I guess that because of this, my presentation, there will be a cultural things in here. So probably this might be the warming up time for that one. So, so to do that, so let me go to the first thing to see what's going on here. So let's first enjoy the paintings first. For example, over here, let me go back. Because to, to warming up over here, oops. Oops, I cannot play those things. Anyway, so this is what it's going to do. So there's a 77 artwork of the with the production data, these are the portrait of Western, uh, the paintings, the, I mean, the female portrait, there is, is a, the, the YouTube clip, which shows a transition between how those female portraits are changing in time over time. So there's a more, more, more public, uh, the change, but since I cannot show that. So these are the 77 portrait with the exact production date. So you can arrange those in time and we scientists always like the number. So I wanted to put some number, not the date, but also I put, wanted to put some number. So how those numbers are changing in time. So we wanted to see the time evolution of a portrait of the woman over the time. So that's what this is about. So I put, I just hide those terms, but probably you can see this like a, some numbers over time. And we found that something is kind of increasing. So actually each point, is uh, represented over these paintings over here and each point are corresponding to each the paintings and then there, there, there is some number. So let me show what this is about. So we are trying to put some number on each painting. So this is kind of approaching art with the science. There has been work, several work on the paintings and science, for example, 
the, the most famous one is about the Jackson Pollock's painting using the fractal analysis. Also, there is a digital technique for our authentication. So using those numbers and the, the scientific method and the physical or the statistical method to find the fake paintings or the trying to find the, who's the painter of these paintings. So if you are having more and more data, then you can narrow down to which one will be the fake and which one is the actually author or the, the painters of those paintings. So that's what we are going to do. So the first thing was a uh, Jackson Pollock's fractal analysis, how those patterns are uh, the organized in terms of fractal. Also there's the art of application using the kind of wave-like things and there also artist identification and also there are other sparse coding techniques were there. And not only paintings, this is so-called style metric. So there's a style and there's metric. So meaning of style metric is measuring the style. So we are just talking about some numbers. We are to, to put some word, numbers to the style, okay? It is also happens in literature and then music as well. So if you're analyzing the bunch of literatures and books and then you can see that what will be the typical pattern of written by Shakespeare and other authors. Also, if you are analyzing all those aesthetic property of the music, then you can distinguish the Baha style and Mozart style. So depending on the composer, you will find some statistical property characteristic. So we are going to do that with the paintings. So before going that, we have to define some terms, uh, terms which is the building block of the painting art. To draw the paintings, we need several things, line, shape, tone, color, light and dark, pattern, texture, and form. And also with that things, there is a, there is a principle of organization. You have to combine those things, to make a unit, balance, rhythm, and proportion, contrast, and movement, and all other using this organization principle, then you can do these things in here. So you have to line and color and combining with the leading and balance and the unity, then you can get this one over here. So since we are scientists, we are going to approaching this problem one by one by divide and conquer. So we will focus on only one thing at first is only colors. To talk about color, we have to introduce this guy over here. I don't know how many of you can recognize him, but he's a Swiss comedian. His name is Ursus Grayley. He's not famous for the comedian. Actually, he's famous for the organizing things. If you give him this kind of picture, then he will organize like this one over here. And if you give him this kind of beautiful sky, the picture, then he will organize like this one over here. If you give him this picture, then he will organize into this kind of things in here. So he is really, really famous for this kind of organization. So I do the same thing. Since we have a picture, like for example, like this one over here, this kind of paintings is in here. Nowadays, most of the paintings are digitally mastered and they can download it from the web gallery. So this is a picture. I'm not going to organize these people's in here. Instead, since this is a digital data, if you magnify this over here, there is so-called pixel. And then I can arrange those pixel organized in the red plot over here. Then you will see that in that picture, those things have this kind of slope over here, like a zip low. We know that what zip low is. So they do have this kind of patterns in here. Since we have many paintings in here, for example, if this dotted line over here, if you are drawing the random pictures, I'm mean, using the only the random colors, then probably you will have a flat line. However, there is a most frequently used colors and the less frequently used colors. So they are following the color over here. And since there are many uh, uh, other paintings there, so depending on the period, medieval, early Renaissance, and Baroque, and up to realism, we are collecting the, the paintings over the millennium. And then at that time, we are you know, collecting like about 9,000 pictures, and then we analyze it. And we compare those things with the, each period. With, medieval time and all in the sense. And then we found that almost them, their tails are collapsed in the single curve. However, and as you can see here, there's one different things, different curve, which is more fat. Actually, that means they are more broadly used the colors that they are. And then that's not the painting, actually, if you compare it, this is a photo. You see that the photo and paintings are different. Since paintings are supposed to be using the, those painting, the, 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 the materials, However, taking a photo with a camera is a different thing. Photo can 
the maintaining of um, the expressing more colors, so they have this kind of fat tails in here. So we can say that paintings and photo are different in terms of the, the, the color usage over here. So this is a, how this graph shows how many colors are used in each pictures. And then since if you're going further, each color point over here has a so-called RGB code. So there is a dimension, three-dimensional quantity over here, RGB, which is the level zero to 256 over here. So you can pick one pixel over here, then you will get three-dimensional coordinate RGB in the scale from zero to 256 over here. So if you have that three-dimensional coordinate, you can put it in the XYZ space over there, then you can put this kind of pictures in here. You can get this kind of data over here. You put every pixel on the picture into the three dimension in the RGB, which is in, you can see the RGB space over here. Then you will see that there is a, there is a spread of those colors. And if those colors are spread widely, then we can say that those pictures have many colors. However, if those things are there, not as fastly, that broadly uh, located, then we can say that the color variety is not that good. So to measure that kind of color variety, so how broadly used color you, we use in the fractal dimension technique, like a, a mass counting dimension over here using here, and then using those slope over here, then you can find that the, for each painting, we can find the dimension of fractal dimension of color spaces, which representing the how many colors, how broadly each color has been used for that one. And we average over the time period, and we found that but the only exceptional case is the medieval, medieval area, the, the period, which is fractal dimension at 2.4, and other time of period is about 2.7 over here. So there's a big difference between medieval area, uh, medieval period and other time period. And why is that? There is a, if you're looking at the, the art history book, then there is a reason why medieval area and age is different because at medieval area, yeah, age, the specific rare pigments were preferred because of a political and religious reason, people's are try, uh, the people's prefer some specific color, for example, ultramarine or the, some dark color for the kind of religious pictures. And also, this is more important thing is that in the medieval area, the, the age, there is no physical mixing technique. At that time, because they don't know how to mix the color, at medieval area, at the medieval age, only mixing technique they can do is that they, uh, they painting one color over here and they recover those things, the recoat those color without different color. It, it is called optical mixing. And so they cannot actually mixing those things because oil paint painting was developed after the Renaissance. So after Renaissance, now this they can mix those proper color together using the oil paintings over here. So after Renaissance over here, they do have more variety of colors to have more variety of color because of this mixing technique. That's why here there is a big difference between the color usage in the medieval age and other period of time. And then, so that was something about the color usage. So we know that there is a big difference between medieval age and the other period of time. And let me go a little bit further for the, the, the more professional term for the, 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 the artist, which is about the light and dark over here. So you know what light and dark is. It is so-called this kind of painting style. We are going to measure two different painting styles. First one is a chiaroscuro and the other one is a spumato. And the chiaroscuro is about the chiaro is a light, oscuro is a dark. So it's about the emphasizing something. So this is brightness difference is used to emphasize something or the contrast or the representing the perspective of the picture. And for example, over here, if you have this kind of picture over here at the bottom, then you can change this picture into grayscale. Then there is a, some part of the painting is very dark and there's a, some part is very white, dark and light. And then using those grayscale, you are changing your two-dimensional painting into the three-dimension, you put height as a brightness over here. If that place is bright, then height is bigger. And if that place is dark, then there are very, very low, low height you can assign. So depending on the brightness, you can define the height. And then you can change the two-dimensional over that into the three-dimension, depending on those brightness measure over here. 
And then after making this two-dimensional picture into the three-dimensional picture, then we can measure the high tide correlation function over this surface here because this is a very rough surface here by measuring the roughly six exponent defined from the high tide correlation over here. Then surface of the roughly six exponent can show how rough each paintings are. In this case, we are not talking about actual oil paintings roughness. We are talking about bright and dark roughness here. If roughly exponent is bigger, that means those paintings are very rough, which means there is a bright part and dark part are very widely used. So using that uh, roughly exponent over there by measuring the correlation, the high tide correlation slope over here, you can define some the, the roughly exponent and then with comparing the with this is a random pictures and then we found that there is a difference in each time period saying that more or less they are kind of increasing over here so as time goes on roughly exponent roughly exponent alpha is increasing which means that as time goes on those pictures are more and more rough which means more and more bright and darkness difference will be there this is can be explainable because you know, the people always looking for more stimulus and more intensive things, more stronger ones. So at this time, this roughness is okay. However, time goes on, people are looking for more stronger and stronger and more intensive stimulus. So there, there is an increasing tendency about their intense, the, the, the roughness over here. So we can see that. And once you have that one, then, so this is how you can do it like this one over here. If you are looking at some pictures, you will see that what kind of thing I'm talking about. So for example, there is a one picture of medieval area. Then you can change it to the three dimension and for the case of all the sounds, you change it to the three dimension and measure the first component and put it there. And then you will see that there is kind of increasing things. So as time goes on, there is a really, really dark and right part is alternating. So those the, the roughly exponents are supposed to be increasing. That's why there is an increased monthly trend. So especially Baroque area, there is a really big roughness over there. So there is a big jump, at, especially at that time. So if you are doing that kind of things, then you will see that these paintings are more and more using the so-called chiaroscuro technique because people prefer to stronger intense stimulus over there. And then, Next thing we are doing is we are going to apply those technique to the this Jackson Pollock's modern art. You see the modern art is really, really different from the classical art. So I think that this is, I still don't understand why this Jackson Pollock's art is that the painting is that expensive. So we measure the same thing over here, or Francis Pollock, you know, the, how Jackson Pollock is doing this kind of thing is that he just the stroke with the, each painter paintings and then Sometimes they just running around the, the, over the canvas with, with, the, with the, those, the, the, the painting cans. And then if you do the things and you will see that they, their picture, their operating exponent is really, really, really small, almost the same as uh, the random, uh, randomly shuffled picture over here. So they are, Jack Pollock's number is really, really different from other things. The other, the classical paintings at least have a, the roughly exponent of about 0 0.2. However, those numbers are really, really, really small. So I think that, that there is a big difference between the classical paintings and the modern paintings. So science cannot explain everything, especially this modern, modern times. I don't know how we can adapt those things to where. So this is increasing, but there is a big drop if you are plotting in terms of time evolution. So after printing, so, and the second, the, the painting started is of course Pumato which is uh, like uh, shading the around eyes to make those the paintings more the, the smooth and other things. To do that, we are using the same technique over here. However, in this case, we are using different term, so-called image entropy over here. This is like a local practice heterogeneities. I'm not going into detail, but there is uh, some the numbers saying that if there is a kind of grading, the gradient things, then you can get some num bigger number than the, the monotonic things is in here then using this one and we also measure the those the image entropy over the time and there is no specific pattern but there is an increase and decrease and each each time period there is a specific 
the, the number and specific degree of uh, heterogeneity for that one. So that was a uh, finding. And, uh, and then with this one, where we write a paper in 2014, and it was featured in the Nature as a the, 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 the title page of the Nature as an evolution of a painting style. With this in mind, because we have a kind of characteristic style of each time period, we did a little bit of uh, the, something else. What if Mona Lisa has been drawn in other period of time? For example, if this is uh, the if those things are uh, drawn in the early Renaissance or Baroque or the, the realism, then since we know that each period, the characteristic that we can change those things, we based on those the the, the properties, and then we change each Mona Lisa for different time. If Mona Lisa has been drawn in different time, then they should look like this one over here. There should be a little bit of uh, the care scroll, and there is a little bit of a matto technique. Also, there is a little bit of preference in the, the, the color palette, so we can do that kind of things as well. Second thing we are talking about is, what if better than the RGB? Since there are many different aspects of the, the paintings, so we are going for the contrast over here. Contrast is not just the bright and darkness. We are talking about the color contrast here. In previous study, we only using the gray scale, the light and dark. There's only one dimension for the, the, the dark part and the light part. However, we are going to using the color contrast since this is British artist Arthur Burkston's work. He is famous for the changing picture into the pie chart. If there is a picture and he is kind of counting the the, the color using the painting, and then he pick up the most, the frequently used color five, and then they put it in the pie chart. For example, so if you give him this kind of picture, then he pick the counting the number of pixels, and then they will pick five colors, and they represent it in this pie chart over here. If you give it this kind of picture, then selecting five most used colors, and then they give you the pictures. However, if you're looking at this five color selection, then there is a something problem because in this picture, of course, most color is blue. However, there is a some yellowish color are missing in here. Over here, of course, there is a bluish color is missing here. So there are some missing colors if you're only counting five because there are more than five colors in here. Of course, these are the majority of the color. However, still we need the other color as well. So why five? We can go further. So better way to detect the main color is a so-called clustering. Since we are familiar with this kind of clustering technique in the, the network science and other stuff in here, it is so-called k-mean clustering. You scatter the point in the, some spaces and then you put some space in the, the kind of central mass and then dividing those things into two different groups and then minimizing the, the average distance between those two, then you will separate the around those centroid, you can separate two groups. So this is a well-known technique for scattered the, the, the point in the space. And not only two, that you can do as many, any, as many as you can, you want. So for example, if you take K3, then you can count in three, you find five, you can find going to 10 or the 15, whatever you want to, to how many color you want to, to pick, then you can put in number, and you put it at the centroid and then you can the, the cent center of mass and you can get all those colors and then their frequency. So not just the five, you can go to the number 10 type pie chart. You can go to the number 15 type pie chart. So this, if you get more and more, more information will be involved as more accurately you can do something. So like this one over here, you can do several things with each thing. So this kind of can be done automatically. So, we do that kind of things. And then this is just a pie chart. But again, we sent like numbers. So we have to find a way to put this information with a single number. So to do that, we define the so-called color contract, which is a weighted average distance between those things here. You see that we know that this red and that this, the green thing is quite different. So based on those, the, the, the proportion, we can make a distance between those colors using this, the weighted average over here. Let me show you here. We are not using the RGB spaces. Instead, we are using the CI left spaces, which is unlike other color space. There are several, many different color spaces you can use. 
for example, we use RGB space for the fractal dimension. However, in this case, it's more like a, it's, a, it's, a, it's related with our perception of our vision. So unlike other color spaces, Euclidean distance of two point in CI lab space is linearly proportional to the perceived difference on human eyes. It's based on the, the current experiments and or other stuff. So RGB space is not that proportional to that Euclidean distance and our concept that the perception is not the linearly proportional. So that to adapt to those, the human eyes, the response is we use the CI lab spaces in here. This is their LAB three axis here. So we define the color construct as a kind of average weight, uh, weighted average color difference. Color differences in this distance is measured using this measure over here. And for example, this thing, color difference, uh, color construct is 0 0.66, and then this is here. And if you compare this one and that one, you will see that how those colors are different. This one is much bigger because there's a big con color construct uh, compared to this one over here. So if you look at this kind of picture, they are not that strongly colored constructs, right? However, if you look at this one over here, there is a really huge difference in color space separation. So this one is supposed to having low color constraints, and this one is supposed to have high color constraints. So if you have a picture, then you can put the average color distance used in that painting. You can calculate all this color construct number. And then that's what I did in the first places over here using the female portrait in Western art with 77. And this number is about the color constraints. And also, again, even for the color contrast, like uh, the chiaroscuro screw technique and light and dark, uh, the technique still, again, in this case, those number is also increasing, saying that people are always looking for a more and more intensive stimulus. Because if you're looking at these kind of pictures over here, you will see that more and more the, the, the opposite colors are used in the painting to show the difference between the, the, the to satisfying the, 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 the observers for the strong stimulus. And then next thing we want to do is a pattern. You see that only color cannot explain the, the, the paintings. For example, if you compare this one and that one, they are using the same number of pixels with the same number of colors. But if you are reshuffling the position of this picture, then you will get this very vague and some dull image over here. So we know that if you have this one over here, if you want to make this one into this one, we know that this is from going from this picture to this one, it's a random shuffling using the random number. And it's easy, right? You can do that by just shuffling all those things. However, from this one over here, going to this direction is all impossible. If you are the really good the painters and the artists, then you can do it. However, by randomly, it's impossible. You know that this is so-called second law of thermodynamics. This is not possible. This is, there is only one direction is easy, the other one is impossible. So that means, so yeah, you don't need to think about it. It's if you are using this material, going back, drawing this kind of beautiful picture is impossible. So that means not only color is important, and then also, but also the position is important. So we have to know the positional information to draw the picture, not just color. We have to add in positional information. So can you propose a concept framework allows to investigate the color constraint and the, 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 the color information and positional information. So we did that kind of things this year, not just a pie chart. We have to put some positional information over here. So if you're going from following this path over here, we are putting one pie chart, two, three, and then more and more with the, 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 the positional information, and you can go to the original paintings this year. For example, it is here again, the, you're following more and more, and then going adding more and more positional information, then you can construct the new paintings, the original paintings is here, here as well. So you can go in from here, you follow your path, and then you end up this kind of things in here. So this is how it looks like. So by dividing and putting the positional information, you can dissecting this kind of things is in here. Okay, to see the, the importance of the positional information, we found that we calculate the color distance. Okay, however, in this case, we are uh, cal calculating the nearest pixel distance between those two. There are several pair you can choose, and then every pair you can calculate the distance in the 
CIA uh, lab space, and then we want to find the distribution of those D. So what will be the distance distribution of color between your pixel? And then if you compare this one and that one, this is totally different picture here. In this area, there is no difference in the nearest pixel. However, there is a big difference. There is abrupt change. There is a big change when we are crossing this boundary over here. However, if you are looking at this picture over here, there's more like a homogeneous. And if you are comparing each pixel, the neighboring pixel, there is not that much difference. So this one is like a big change. However, there's a kind of smooth change. So to show that kind of things. So again, you can put, this is different from previous one. This is using the color distance things in here. So there is a big change, peak change. However, there's more like a smooth change for the nearest pixel and using those things and then doing the distribution for the, as a function of distance, they do have different things. There is a big difference. There is a peak position here. However, if you're this, looking at this, so there's a kind of exponentially decreased, faster decays, decay distribution function. So this is more like a fast distribution. However, this is fast decay. To distinguish those things, we are defining so-called seamlessness S number over here, which is uh, the, similar to the burstiness parameter into event time distribution over here. If there is some things are changing interruptly, uh, the, the abruptly, then we can get this kind of things in here plus one value. And if they are really, really uniformly distributed and then it will give you a minus one. So, so this is the, the standard deviation. This is average. So sigma minus D over sigma plus D will give you the S and it represents if they are the very inhomogeneous then you will plus one and very uniformly distributed, it will give you minus one. So there is a kind of measure distinguish those two. And so for example, this Mondrian picture has a plus value and this Monet picture has a minus value because th there is a big jump over here. However, there's not that big jump in this Monet picture. So because of that one, so we are measuring those things as a, again, okay, so collecting all those many different pictures and then we throw as a function of time over here. And these are the S value, I just explained. And then as you can see in here, there is a kind of trend. And we notice there is some trend is that the S value is, the distribution of S value is increasing. So if you're looking at each time, and there is a variance and then here, variances when, when as time goes on, those variance is kind of increasing. That means actually, if you're looking at closely, then there is a increasing temporal, uh, temporary dip and increasing. And if you're only looking at the standard deviation, then there is a keep increasing. Saying that S value is getting broader and broader here, broader and broader means there is a minus S value and bigger S value at the same time. So there is a difference for those two. And there is increasing trend. So for the case individual as well, because some painters are drawing several painters, paintings, painters are drawing several paintings. So if you're collecting all those things, you can also uh, measure the time trend of those individuals, the, 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 the seamlessness as number over here. And then also there is a variance is increasing. And so that is explainable because we know that in the modern art, the, the diversity is important. So that's why the Jackson Pollock is explainable because he are looking for the really, really different, want to draw the different picture. That's why diversity comes in. So you can see that his picture is, is, is probably the, the extreme value in that thing is here. Also, if you're only looking at one painter, for example, Mondrian, he used to draw in the normal picture. However, as time goes on, he, have, he is going more and more abrupt and then this is simple paintings. So they do have, he is having some kind of trend. And there is another opposite direction as well. Actually, if you're looking at the Noir, he was drawing this kind of well-defined classical picture. However, if time goes on, he is more like a more vague and the, 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 not that kind of homogeneous picture changing into the homogeneous pictures. If you drawing that kind of thing as a, is, uh, the, is, uh, the, as time, then Mondrian case is as value is increasing. The Noir case as value is kind of decreasing since he is getting more and more clear, it's more and more blue blob. So some painters are increasing, some paint, painters are decreasing. So we can get the, what 
is the style of his painting as time goes on in his lifetime. And we can get all those things and then we measure the slope. And then we found that there are some few extreme values. There is a really, really plus extreme value and there's really minus extreme value. And we found that this is the most, uh, the, the, the dramatically changing from this picture. The Claude Morin is, he used to, at first time, he used to draw in this kind of pictures and then he ends up these kind of pictures. So he, he has a, some trend from vague well, to the- I guess that you should truly go to your conclusion, please. Yeah? Okay. Just and then have time for discussion, please. There are several peoples going from he. Some people always like this kind of discrete pictures, and some people always drawing this kind of picture. So there is some things there. And then finally, this is more the quite recent work, which are looking at the, the proportion. So there is a central question. Probably you may hear this is a bit long history. So is there any certain proportion people prefer over time? So it was uh, designed by this Euclid over here, it's human mean ratio. So what will be the good number dividing this rectangle over here? What will be the ratio to this largest two? This one will be the same as this one to this one. And if you're solving those things, those golden number is 1.618, one plus square root of five over two. And if you are putting in this one, then there is a section should be 0.618, and this was 0.82. People say that this is a golden ratio, and that many people are claiming that this is a really, really good, and people feel like this kind of ratio. And then it's really, and of course, they are drawing this one over here, and then showing that even Mona Lisa and the, this kind of picture, they are claiming that it is properly that the, 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 they do have this kind of the golden ratio in the Mona Lisa. And then, of course, in the early days, they do in, uh, inter uh, interpolate those things in product design. Actually, they are using those numbers to making these things. Even the, this is a little bit different, but even Trump has a golden ratio numbers. So I don't know how he do that thing, but still, they are claiming that golden ratio is there. And then there was experiments saying that this, yeah. he was the first one to the, the by survey showing people this kind of different rectangle and then which one to prefer. And then it turns out the survey returns through that the golden ratio was a preferable. And then this guy has more the rectangle and show that the, again, the, the, the that thing is preferable. But things this survey result is cannot believable. So usually simple shape is not that precise. So we want to find the more scientific and more precise way of doing those things. And so we are using these things in here. If you have a picture and you draw the line and then you can get some information, entropy, I'm, because I'm running over time. So you can measure some entropy between this area and that area. So first measure the, the information, color, color the information without, the, without the, the, the dissection and then you get the information and then you dividing those things and you get calculating each information and if you, the, the subtract those numbers and you will get the, how much information you can get by dividing these things. And then if you are changing those lines over here, then those information will be, there is a, some special line which you have the most information you can get. So there is some line, you can get the peak over here, especially in this case, this is a line. So by adapting this compositional information, we, you can using those line, getting those things in the, the automatically. So if you're having this one over here, then the, the program can automatically dissecting those things where you should put your information line over there. So once you have this kind of all those information, then you can find the most preferable and the, the, the line you can get. So we wanted to compare whether actually this number is close to the golden ratio. So result is here is a thing. So actually if you go further and further, so most picture paintings, especially landscape painting, as for instance, the horizontal is the most favorable dissection. And then this thing, this is the result. So as time goes on, these are, if those, there is a, some kind of golden ratio, then it should be a, there is a preferable reference over here or here. But as you can see, there is a real, real, real change, great continuously changes. So there is no specific reason why we are preferring the golden ratio as well. So there is a, also there's a, some peoples are using those, the, the, the 
the pictures and then we also analyze the, the painter's characteristic, but I will skip, skip those things. And there is one, which is Claude Lorraine, which is a French, French painter. He really liked the golden ratio and he always using those things. And then even go to the, if you go to the museum, he had this kind of cosmos as well. So he is a big fan of golden ratio, but the, our conclusion is that golden ratio was found to be most preferable only for some artist period and only some for artists. So there's no such thing as a golden ratio over time. So it is a changing, especially nowadays about one third is more like a new golden rule that people prefer. And that's what we did. So finally, so what we are trying to do is can we analyze and understand the art with the science? Well, throughout the series of paper, we say that maybe you can do something, not everything, but we can do something. So that's our conclusion. And then with that in mind, we are also collaboration with uh, the visual artists to do what kind of, uh, how we can help them to uh, make the new art in here. And so these are the references. And then if you are interested, then you can find more information here. And then you can have a person actually, he is the one doing all those analysis. So you can ask him. And thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. It was a very interesting uh, talk, but unfortunately, we are just uh, out of time now. So, yeah. so I, I, I suggest that uh, if somebody has questions, we can use the chat or the discussion around now. Okay, okay thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, with this, uh, the scientific part of this uh, morning section is over, and we go to the real cultural part and uh, I give uh, the word back to Zoltan and to Robert Olaga, please. Thank you very much, uh, Ferenc. Thank you very much for chairing this section. And thank you very much, Havang, also for this interesting and enlightening presentation about arts and the relation with science. Uh, I just realized now as organizers, we made a big mistake because we will have a cultural presentation about the painting school in Baia Mare, in Albano, one of the most prominent painting schools in the, uh, Transylvania and in Hungary. And we should have put that cultural presentation after your talk. But I also realized there was a problem because Victoria Barajoy, who will present this painting school, is not available today. So that was, I think, the reason that we couldn't do that. So uh, by this being said, I will continue on, on presenting something about uh, Transylvania. Um, I, I, I wanted to offer you, we, the organizers, wanted to offer you, first of all, some facts about the history of Transylvania, some cultural points, since you're missing the trips and missing uh, being here. And also there was an idea to offer you something about the science here in Transylvania and the art. And today talks is about science in Transylvania. I don't feel really competent to make this talk because I will speak about a mathematician, a famous mathematician from Transylvania with Janusz Bojai. And uh, I have asked my colleagues to do this presentation from mathematics and unfortunately all of them were unavailable for this time. So what we have come up uh, is together with my colleague from the Sapienza University, Robert Olagar, that uh, we will make a shared presentation I will try to share then the screen. Let's see if it is working well. It should. I think you see my slides and hope it will, it will work. So um, what we want to, to do here is uh, to change your view about Transylvania because when we speak about Transylvania to everybody, it comes to mind Dracula, but we have many other famous people coming from here. And one of this is Janusz Bojai. Um, he is one of the creator of the non-Euclidean geometry. He was born here in my hometown in Kolozsvár, Kuznapoka. My university is also named after him. So it's, uh, as you know, the name of the university is Bárosboja. It's not Babes, uh, 
uh, it's Babes, who is a Romanian doctor, and Boyoi, who is this famous Hungarian mathematician, and died in Turkmuresh, Marusvasherhe, which is also a town close to Cluj, 100 kilometers from Cluj. Okay, so according to Stephen Hawking, uh, Janos Boyai is in the short list of those scientists who really changed our thinking paradigms. And uh, I, would, I would say from the beginning that he's one of those three figures who are the founders of non Euclidean geometry together with the Carl Friedrich Gauss and Lobachevsky. And of course, then we have to also mention here Riemann, who was the one who put it in a very elegant formalism, what all these people have done. Good. So uh, I think the biggest merit of Janos Boyai in, in shaping our thinking and our uh, in our mathematical thinking is to draw our attention on postulates. Uh, we all know that mathematics is built on postulates, and everything what is true or false in mathematics is a question of what we have postulated, and. Later on, Gödel um, made it this logical way of thinking very clear and also stated a lot of in, in important theorems. And I would say that Boyai was the first one who drew our attention on the importance of the postulates. In, in physics, we, we also have postulates and all our physical thinking is also built on the postulates. Uh, our postulates are usually facts that we cannot prove it, but they don't contradict the experiments. In mathematics, something is, is different because mathematicians build a virtual world on the postulates. So they don't, they don't uh, want to describe the real world. And in order to describe them, they appeal to some postulates, which they cannot explain. But they state some postulate, build a virtual world, and if this virtual world is good for physics, then the physics will take it and will use it. Okay, so let me just iterate a little bit on the postulates and on the importance of postulates in shaping our world. And I will also continue the cultural journey in Transylvania and present you some pictures about villages. And these pictures that you see here, they are uh, pictures in, uh, in the Saxon region of Transylvania, where Germans have lived. And you can notice here that the houses are, are very ordered and they are very nice shapes. So the angles, the triangles, and, uh, and especially the rectangle are, are very well kept. And if you go to another region of Transylvania, which is around Cluj, which is in the Apusin Mountains, uh, you will see a different type of architecture here. Uh, it's, here it's very hard to find any rectangular shape. So all houses, usually the surfaces are not really plain and, uh, and the angles are, are usually very far from rectangle. And very uh, a few years ago, I realized why is this big difference and everything relies on postulates. So when uh, a building team engineers come to build a, a house in, in the Saxon region, they use a rectangle like that. And when I wanted to restore a house here, to renovate a house here in the Abusin Mountains, uh, uh, then when the team from the village came to me, the first thing they did, they made the rectangle by uh, putting together two sticks and then they postulated that this is the rectangle and of course the whole world they are constructing from this one has is is reminder on the postulate they used for what is the rectangle so so you, you see from here that that the geometry that we have is very much dependent on what we postulate uh, we all know this geometry we, we all know the the famous Euclid's plane geometry. This is what we learn in, in school. And we all know also that this was the first rigorous thinking system or the first rigorous way of constructing the world. It was a virtual world, but it, this virtual world became important in physical applications. And 
Euclid's plane geometry is built on some axioms and postulates. Mathematicians do not make very, very big difference between what is axiom and what is postulate. They use the same word for stating something that they cannot prove. I, I, I want to make here a small difference. I will call axioms those postulates which are related to our way of thinking and of our way of logically deriving things. For instance, an axiom is if A is equal with B and B is equal with C, then A is equal with C. Yes? So this is an axiom for me. And postulates are some uh, things that help us to construct this virtual world on the axioms, on the logical way we are thinking. So in this way, mathematicians many times say that Euclid's geometry is built on uh, 11 axioms. I would say they are built on six axioms and five postulates. And the first four, uh, these postulates of Euclid gives us the possibility to construct shapes to make shapes in the surface, to make shapes in the plane. And there are four postulates that we have learned. And there is the fifth postulate, which triggered a lot of debates after uh, Euclid. So this fifth postulate is the famous parallels postulate, which is stated in a very, very interesting manner. There is no word about uh, parallel in the original formulation of Euclid. If you read the fifth postulate, it says that if a straight line intersects two other straight lines and so makes the two interior angles on one side of it together less than two right angles, then the other straight lines will meet at a point if extended far enough on the side on which the angles are less than two right angles. So this is not as it is stated about parallels, but there are a lot of equivalent formulation of the fifth postulates, and which is about parallel. And the most known one is the so-called Playfair's formulation or the Playfair's axiom, which says that if we have a line and we have a point which is not on the line, at most one line parallel to the given line can be drawn through that point. And uh, mathematicians for a long time was were thinking that this fifth postulate is can be derived from the previous one. So it was a long debate on the fifth postulate whether you really need it or you don't need it. You can construct a geometry and you can announce a lot of theorems in geometry by not using the fifth postulate. So just using um, uh, uh, just using the the first four postulates and the axioms, you can derive the so-called absolute geometry. And this absolute geometry is independent of the fifth postulate. And uh, since it was a long debate, people put up, do we really need the fifth postulate? And what if we would change this fifth postulate? And that was Boya's fantastic idea. So he was the first one who questioned whether if we would change the fifth postulate of geometry, can we get a word which is consistent? So it's a consistent word in which we would have theorems and we, we can prove those theorems. And might this word, this virtual word, would be also appropriate to describe somehow the reality we are living in. Uh, from the beginning, I have to say here that at those times, there were in geometry, there was no metrics. So they did not have the geometry that we know nowadays, the differential geometry, which is up to Riemann. So the geometry was much more geometry without metric. And the interesting things were to prove these theorems uh, out from the postulates that we have put it. Uh, there, the, at that time also, it was known that there are other geometries as well. So not only this, this plane geometry of Euclid, a special geometry which was known already by, by, by long before Boya, it was the geometry on the, on the, on the sphere, which is a special case of, a case of what we know today is the elliptic geometry. And this uh, geometry is built on other postulates. So if you would state a sphere geometry, there you need also points and lines. 
and points and lines are constructed in another manner somehow. And what is interesting that you can make a relation between the plane geometry and the geometry on the sphere by making some compactifications. The points are points on the sphere and the lines in the, in the spherical geometry are the great circles. The great circles are those circles on the sphere which, can, which define a plane which goes through the center of the sphere. And then there is a method, a very simple method that you can project the, the Euclidean plane geometry on the sphere. So the points are projecting, so a projection that you have the pole here, the pole of the sphere, and then you unite it with a point in the, in the plane and the point where you are intersecting the sphere, this is the projection of this point on the sphere. And the lines are projected in the, in the great circles in the following way. So you have a line and then you have the center of the circle. The center of the circle and this line defines a plane. And this plane, uh, then this plane, which is here in yellow, intersects the, the sphere and the intersection makes a great, star, so the great circle. Here is the great circle in, in, uh, in uh, gray shadows. And this is the line, the projection of the line in, uh, in, uh, the, in the, in, on, on the sphere. You already see that in the spherical geometry, the fifth postulate is not true anymore. So uh, there is no parallel lines in the sense that it was said in the fifth axiom because all lines intersect each other. So you, if you, you, you have two great circles, two great circles always intersect each other. And in this sense, you see that although you can construct a logical and consistent uh, way of, of, of thinking, so you can construct a geometry on the spherical space, you don't really need the parallels postulate. And in fact, the parallel postulate is not even true in this geometry. Uh, Boyai has chosen another way at that time. So he proposed, instead of the fifth postulate, another postulate, which stated the following, that given a line and the point which is not on it, it should be at least two lines uh, to the given line, which is parallel with the, with, the, with, with, with the original line, and is going to through this point. And so he took all the other axioms of Euclid and then put in this new, new uh, postulate and looked up what he gets. So what is the geometry that you get by replacing this postulate? Uh, this is a very complex geometry you will have. In fact, you cannot even embed it, the surfaces. This will be a plane geometry in some sense also because it will be a surface geometry. But the surfaces that you get by this one cannot be embedded in the three-dimensional space. So you cannot visualize what you are constructing. But you get a consistent way of proving theorems and proving interesting things, you can define shapes in, in this geometry also. You can define triangles and other types of shapes. And, and you can construct a new world, a new world out of nothing. And that was the big, the fantastic uh, paradigm changing thought of Boyoi that he realized that such virtual worlds can be also consistent, like it is a consistent word, the Euclidean geometry. How can one in, in a simple manner imagine some, some geometry? Because this is the first problem every physicist would, 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 would put. So since we cannot show how the surfaces are in this geometry, how can we illustrate or how can we feel what happens in such geometry? So one model for this one is the famous Poincaré half plane model, which is defined, you can define a half plane in the following way that you take the half of the plane and this dividing line, you, you note it as infinity. And then you have another point here, which is an infinity point. And then what you can do, you can have two types of straight lines in this half plane model. One straight line, all, all the lines are going from infinity to infinity. 
So in these geometries, the, the lines that you define, they are going from one infinity to the other infinity. But we, since we have two types of infinities, you can have straight lines, which is going from this blue line to this red point, which is one type of, of, of straight line. And another type of straight line, which is going from the blue points to any blue points. So any circle that you can imagine here, this is also a straight line in this Poincaré half model. And then if you take the fifth uh, postulate, for instance, in such a geometry, you have a line here. Let's see, this is the red line. You have a point outside of it. So you have this point where the black lines intersect, for instance, the blue one. And you see that through this point, you can draw, in fact, a lot of straight lines, which are, which are parallel with the, with, the, with the red one. So they never intersect. And they are infinite in the sense they are going from infinity to infinity. And uh, uh, you can see that this fifth postulates, then it's, it's changed in this uh, Poincaré half plane model. So let me come this a little bit closer to physicists, mostly to physicists who are, who are uh, used to, to the Riemannian uh, differential geometry. Um, First of all, I would like to say that his uh, Boyer's geometry, what he constructed by changing the fifth postulate, is totally equivalent with Lobachevsky's geometry, which was constructed independently. I will speak about a little bit uh, later. And uh, um, the geometry that we have here is a geometry where the matrix has a negative curvature in its space. If you would try to write up the matrix, it would look like this one. Uh, and inside this geometry, if you draw a triangle on the surface, the sum of the angles inside the triangle is less than 180 degrees. So in, in, this is the consequence that we have negative curvature in each point. The Euclidean geometry, the plane geometry that we are using today, is a geometry where the sum of the triangles, uh, the sum of the angles in the triangle is 180 degree. The matrix is the simple matrix that we all know. And uh, the spherical geometry, or in general, the, gen the elliptic geometries in general, they have a positive curvatures. And on a surface like that, the sum of the angles in a triangle is always bigger than 180 degrees. Uh, one, another, not yet another model, which is uh, not really true, but it's locally true for the Boyer geometry, is realized on the pseudosphere. The pseudosphere is an object which is drawn here somehow. But uh, I draw your attention, as mathematician taught me, so as uh, Robert and other mathematicians like Borgochov, I discussed with him a lot. So they warned me that I shouldn't say that this is the the, 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 the surface in which the Boyer geometry is realized because this is only locally. So in a very small neighborhood of any point, the geometry looks like on the pseudosphere as the Boyer geometry. So I told you the Boyer geometry cannot be visualized. So we cannot put it in a 3D space. Uh, it has been shown that the, the, the smallest dimension in which you could visualize the Boyer geometry is a six dimensional space. Good. Uh, one reason why you cannot, you cannot, for instance, say that this pseudosphere is a realization of the Boyer geometry is because on a Boyer geometry, usually the geodesics are infinite. And in this space, in the pseudospheres, you have both geodesics that are finite and they are also infinite. Good. So, uh, I just wanted to, to introduce you a little bit about uh, the Boyer geometry and to, to, to realize that at that time, that was a paradigm changing thinking that you can construct a, a world which you cannot even imagine it in a three dimensional space, but you can construct a logical way of thinking. About it. So um, uh, this works of Boyer has been written in his appendix. This is one of our very important uh, heritages in Transylvania, but it's not kept in Transylvania. It's kept, the appendix of Boyer is kept in, in the central library, in the academy library in Budapest. His famous letter to his father said that I have created another new word out of nothing. And then later, 
much later his uh, appendix was published so that was uh, after the death of unfortunately after the death of of uh, Janusz Burek it was published nowadays this uh, appendix is a UNESCO world heritage uh, maybe I should tell you something about the father also, the father of Boyai. The father of Boyai was Farkas Boyai, who was also a mathematician. He was born in Boya, which is a village in Transylvania, and died in Turkmenistan, also Marushvashare. He was also a very famous mathematician. He was uh, not only a school teacher at the reformed school of Turkmenistan, but was an active researcher. He was studying mathematics for, uh, in Göttingen, and there he became friends with Gauss, so that was a very productive uh, way, years that he spent in Göttingen. Uh, it was a very close relation, it began to be a very close relation between Göttingen and Gauss. Uh, they had very many enlightening discussions uh, together, and it is said that when uh, uh, Farkas Boya, he had to come back to Transylvania, finishing his studies in Göttingen. It was an interesting fact that, that he, he, he stayed there because he had no money to come back. And that was the years that he learned most in mathematics until he raised so much money that he could come back to Transylvania. He had a very many enlightening discussion with Gauss. And after they, uh, Farkas came back, they agreed with Gauss that each last day of the month, they spoke, they smoked together a pipe, one a smoke pipe, one which uh, Farkas gave it to Gauss and one which Gauss gave it to Farkas together on the same evening hours and they would think uh, about each other. So uh, Farkas Boya already had a lot of attempts towards the non-Euclidean geometry. He also tried to prove that the fifth postulate can uh, it's it's uh, can be he, he had this idea that it can be proven from the from the, the from the previous ones but of course he didn't manage to do that he worked also much on the axiomatic foundation of arithmetics and he also had some contribution in the theory of complex numbers so boyai uh, had from where to to get his his uh, uh, genius in uh, mathematics so his father was also a remain mathematician and uh, what about Janusz Boya so as I told Janusz Boya he was born in 1802 in Cluj in Kolozsvár and uh, he wanted also to study in Göttingen so his father wanted to send him to Ga at, uh, at the school of Gauss to study there but unfortunately he couldn't raise any money so he he studied in a military academy in Vienna. Um, um, here, very close to our university, you can find a house. It's still up where Janusz Boya was born. Um, nowadays, it's a big, rich house for mathematicians. They really, when they come to Cluj, this is a place they, they, they usually visit. So except uh, of his contribution in non-Euclidean geometry and hyperbolic geometry, he had another other very important contributions to mathematics. He was proved, he proved that it's possible to scale the circle on a hyperbolic space, although it is not possible to do that uh, in, the, in the Euclidean space. This was a big problem that to show that with the liner and with um, a compass, you can draw a circle that you can go a square which has the same um, uh, area than a circle. And you cannot do that in, in the Euclidean geometry, but you can do that in the hyperbolic geometry. He proved independently Jeanne's theorem of pseudo primes, and also he proved independently the Ruffini Abel theorem according to which there is no general solution uh, for equations of fifth or higher order. And then maybe it, here is the time that maybe I should mention something about the parallel life of Janusz Boya and Nikolai Lobachevsky, because they too independently discovered the same two virtual world. They had different approach on that one. But uh, the geometry they constructed is totally the same. So they, they imagined the same virtual world. Interestingly, the works were done exactly in the same period. 
So um, here are also their works. So the appendix, the famous appendix of Janusz Bojai, and here you have also the, the works of, um, of Lobachevsky. Uh, the works of, of the appendix of uh, Janusz Bojai was written between 1820 and 1823. And also in, during this time, Lobachevsky independently was lecturing on a new surface geometry in uh, Kazan University, where he became also the president of the university and rector. And his work on geometry was completed in 1823, but it appeared only in 1829 and 1837. The appendix of Bouayai was published much later. It is also known that Janusz Bojai became aware of the work of Lobachevsky. So uh, later he, he became aware of what Lobachevsky had did, and he was uh, truly admiring Lobachevsky's work. Unfortunately, Lobachevsky didn't hear about Bojai and about Bojai's work. Uh, this is a famous quote of one of the letters of Bojai, who says that as long as in Russia there exists such a beautiful and good mind, with noble direction or ambition as Lobachevsky, there is at least enough reason or basis to take the biggest hope for the higher education of the Russian old man. So he wrote a lot of letters to his father about Lobachevsky's work also. And what about Gauss? We have to speak here about Gauss, because Gauss was the one who elaborated the general theory of surfaces and surface geometries in general. And this was later, which was finalized in Riemann's, Riemann's uh, work, and which created also the premises of Einstein's general theory of relativity. Gauss was aware of both works, of the works of both Boyai and Lobachevsky. Farkas Boyai, as I told you, as a close friend to Gauss, sent the appendix to Gauss, and Gauss read it very carefully. Um, uh, there is a lot of debate on, on the reaction of Gauss to, to, to the work of Boyai. Um, a lot of historians in Hungary, they, they have problems with Gauss, saying that Gauss did not popularize enough uh, Boyai's work. And in fact, there is evidence that he wrote to Farkas the following statement, if I have to praise your son's achievement, Unfortunately, I have to praise myself since I came to the same conclusions many years ago, but I have not no courage to put this on paper. So uh, this is what many Hungarian history historians say that this was not a nice gesture about Gauss. But uh, uh, in fact, Gauss has a very big role in popularizing Boyer's geometry. Gauss was the only person at that time who could understand the deep thinking of Boyer and uh, uh, I think if this work wouldn't get to Gauss, um, probably Boyer's geometry have, would have been forgotten totally. So Gauss was the only one who could imagine the deep thinking and the new geometry that, that uh, Boyer have, have created. Uh, nowadays, we keep a lot of um, um, 14,000 pages of Janusz Boyai's uh, manuscript. Um, at that time, uh, he became a very lonely researcher here in Transylvania. He felt very isolated. He didn't have any broad-minded broad companion or friends that he could discuss his ideas. So what he did, he put his thoughts on paper and he was conversing with himself. So all the notes that he put it, they are in Hungarian, German and Latin. And nowadays they are kept in, in uh, Maros Vashar in Neumark in the Teleteka, which is one of our famous libraries. And libraries, we have also Newton's Principia there. And um, uh, from these letters and from this uh, manuscript that he has written, we learned a lot about his wide interest uh, in arts and philosophy. Unfortunately, here in Transylvania, he did not become known at his time. He was not respected as a, as a great scientist. Uh, he was uh, working as a military engineer, but also he retired very soon because he, he got some illness and he suffered from this illness a lot. So it, it, due to this, he had a very, a very let's say, unrespected uh, 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 retirement period, and he was only conversing with himself, so he became very close. Uh, 
Janusz Boyai's geometry uh, sometimes is also uh, um, taken by physicists as one of the first idea which led to, to general relativity. There are indeed some ideas about physical space and geometry which are already present in the Boyois manuscripts. So if we read these manuscripts and there are still a lot that we can learn from it. He has there a statement which I am translating it from Hungarian. The laws of gravity should be in close relation with the nature of the space its creation and properties in general with all happenings in nature. So he had this idea that the geometry which we have to use in physics is uh, somehow uh, linked to the matter which is in the universe and the distribution of the matter in the universe is, is telling us what kind of uh, geometry we should, we should use. And uh, let me go quickly to the end of my talks. So nowadays, uh, Janos and Farkas Boyai, they became two Transylvanian heroes. Uh, they are well respected scientists. We did rediscover them, unfortunately, too late, that we have people that we can be really proud of it because they are world, world known scientists. There is an entire cult of the Boyais in Transylvania. Uh, we have streets, schools, uh, prizes, fellowships uh, named in their honors, uh, books, uh, plays, uh, both fiction and documentary ones are read, read, read one. And as I told you at the beginning of my talk, except Dracula, we do have other famous personalities as well. And I would say that Janusz Boyai was one of his. And the only place when after he died, it was recognized is my town here in Kolozhvar and I'm proud of it. So on the day he, do, he died in 80, uh, after his death in 1816 in Kolozhvar, was published this, uh, these uh, words here. And you see that these words already recognize Janusz Boyai as a world famous mathematician. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. I hope uh, I didn't take too much of your time. And um, usually we do not have questions during this uh, cultural presentation since it's not related to, to the conference. But if you have questions, I would direct you to my collaborator mostly, who is uh, Robert Olagal. Uh, he's not here, but he's uh, watching us uh, in the YouTube in the YouTube transmission. He wrote an excellent booklet for physicists about Boyer's geometry and about the Boyer's idea. If anybody is interested, uh, we would be happy to send them a PDF. You can ask me either by chat or uh, email, and I think Olaga Robert will be also happy to send you. Yes.